Thank you. Uh, I should perhaps restate that when Sahmat asked me to give these four lectures, uh, I thought that I would treat the October Revolution not as an event, not as something which should be celebrated only in museums, but as something that marked a decisive turn in human history. It entailed the beginning of a new journey for humanity. And I thought I would actually devote these four lectures to outlining the course of that journey, not so much in terms of historical details, but more in through a sort of conceptual engagement. And this is what I've been trying to do. And as a result, today's lecture would be concerned mainly with the uh, contemporary world, because this is the point at which the journey has until now arrived. Uh, in my last lecture, I had talked about the spontaneity of capitalism, by which I meant that it is a self-driven system subject to its own imminent tendencies. And the intervention by the state, by the capitalist state, is essentially to promote, hasten, aid these imminent tendencies. There may be periods in history where even the capitalist state is constrained to take measures in order to uh, put a roadblock in the realization of these tendencies. But unless such intervention cumulatively and recursively increases in scale, ultimately resulting in a transcendence of the system, these tendencies once more assert themselves. It's in that sense that I had talked about it as a spontaneous system. What I want to draw your attention to today is that the spontaneity of capitalism is something that really constitutes, to my mind, the crux of the difference between the Marxist position and a liberal position. In fact, the starting point of the Marxist position, to my mind, is a cognition of the spontaneity of capitalism. Now, this is not a point which is often recognized. It is not only anti-Marxists, but even Marxists, who really do not often appreciate the enormous distance traveled by Marx compared to his predecessors like Adam Smith and Ricardo. Paul Samuelson, a liberal economist, had referred to Marx as a minor post-Ricardian. Most Marxists themselves basically see Marx's contribution relative to classical political economy as consisting in what, they, what, what one calls historicizing Ricardo. That basically classical political economy had thought that history ended with capitalism. But in fact, according to Marx, uh, history continues beyond capitalism and it actually, you know, uh, leads on uh, through the transcendence of capitalism to a new mode of production, socialism. So often we have actually thought in terms of Marx's distance from Ricardo as consisting only in this fact. But the fact that history not ending with capitalism and therefore in a sense historicizing Ricardo also entails inverting the entire corpus of, cap of, of classical political economy. I don't mean the details. I mean in terms of the perspective of classical political economy. This is a point which you often missed even by the Marxists themselves. And this inversion consists in the fact that there is a spontaneity of capitalism cognized by Marx which is completely missing in classical political economy and indeed in the entire corpus of liberal thought. Now, a way of, 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 of coming to this question, for instance, would be 
to go back to Isaiah Berlin's 1958 essay, Two Concepts of Liberty. Now, Isaiah Berlin revived an earlier philosophical tradition in arguing that we should distinguish between uh, negative liberty and positive liberty and arguing that a positive concept of liberty, a concept of positive liberty, which for instance characterizes Marxism, has the potential, has an authoritarian potential within it. As distinct from this, he therefore emphasized uh, the concept of negative liberty, which means that individuals, individual agents are free of the coercion, which can be exercised externally by others, including the state. Now, what this entire conception misses or the question it does not confront is what about the coercion that is exercised by the spontaneity of the system? It's not a coercion exercised by any individual. It's not a coercion exercised in terms of the political authoritarianism of a particular regime, but it's a coercion that is exercised by the spontaneity of the system itself. Now, is that coercion something whose overcoming is essential for negative liberty? And if it is essential for negative liberty, since this overcoming would require the overcoming of spontaneity, it would necessarily be associated with Marx had talked about with what Marx had talked about in terms of positive liberty. So even this distinction is based on the fact that coercion which is exercised by the spontaneity of the system is not actually cognized within liberal theory. Uh, this is something which gets carried over when, when, when Frederick von Hayek, I mean this an entire question of the nature of coercion were, has been discussed. Frederick von Hayek, for instance, argued that the coercion to be overcome is one which must be intentional. In other words, the coercion that we object to, which has to be overcome for the achievement of negative liberty, is intentional coercion. But of course, the fact that there can be a systemic coercion was negated by him because the kind of economic system that he believed in, the kind of economic logic he believed in, simply did not recognize the spontaneity of the system. In short, differences which appear on first sight to be differences in political philosophy can also be ultimately traced to differences in economic analysis. Now, this is something which, again, uh, I would like to take a bit of time in distinguishing between Marx and Smith's attitudes to capitalism and indeed to commodity production that gives rise to capitalism to establish this particular point. Now, obviously, one of the propositions that is very strongly held within Marxism is that capitalism emerges out of a system of commodity production. But what is the system of commodity production? It is not correct to say that every production for the market is necessarily commodity production. As a matter of fact, within Marxism, uh, and a, a product becomes a commodity only when, even though it is both a use value and an exchange value for the buyer, it is only an exchange value for the seller. In other words, a product becomes a commodity when it ceases to be an, a use value for the, for the seller. For the seller, it only represents claim to a certain amount of money. Now, for this itself to happen, there has to be a kind of impersonality between the buyer and seller. Because obviously, if there's a personal relationship between the buyer and the seller, the fact that the product is a use value to a buyer would also rub itself, would also rub itself on, off on, the, on, on the seller himself. The seller would, because of his personal relations with the, with, with the buyer, also see it as a use value, and that is a negation of commodity production. So commodity production necessarily entails an impersonality in the relationship between the buyer and the seller. And this impersonality typically arises, as I said, not with the local halwai or the local panwala. And therefore, the proposition that commodity production produces capitalism is not a proposition that can, that can be extended to societies in which there have been millennia of, 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 of sale in the market, 
but that does not constitute authentic commodity production. Authentic commodity production that entails impersonality is something that only arises through a certain historic development and we know that Henri Pirenne argued that the emergence of European capitalism was related to the opening up of Mediterranean trade. In other words, long distance trade, for instance, introduces the kind of impersonality that is associated with authentic commodity production that gives rise to differentiation and therefore that acts as a progenitor of capitalism. Obviously, if there's long distance trade, impersonality, anybody selling for this market which is far away with competitors you do not know with buyers you do not know obviously it's a market itself that you are not very familiar with you are subject to potential crisis and then these crises give rise to differentiation and therefore they give rise to uh, uh, differentiation among the petty commodity producers giving rise to capitalism. Now if so then not only is there a spontaneity of capitalism, but the spontaneity of capitalism is also associated with a spontaneity of, of the commodity production as a precursor of capitalism. That too acts as a kind of coercive force on the petty commodity producers themselves, among whom it introduces a tendency towards differentiation. So once you are caught in this process of authentic commodity production, and therefore, in the process of transition to capitalism, you are in a sense caught in a process of spontaneity. Then it is not your individual volition what you decide to do or not to do, but it is something which actually arises because of the pressures exerted by you, uh, up upon you by the system. As a matter of fact, the idea that all sale is, or, or all production for the market constitutes ipso facto commodity production is an idea that was actually propagated during the uh, Cultural Revolution in China and it represents in my view an ultra-left tendency. The idea therefore was all commodity production is potentially capitalist and if you want to prevent the emergence of capitalism then you have to suppress all commodity or, or all production for the market even though it may not be authentic commodity production. Now contrast this with Adam Smith's idea. According to Adam Smith, people sell in the market because they have a propensity, as Smith called it, to truck, barter and exchange. In other words, participation in the market is something which arises out of the individual volition. This participation in the market by a whole lot of producers produ gives rise to no differentiation of any kind. There is no coercion acting on the producers to act in particular ways, to cut costs, for instance, in order to survive even in this competitive struggle. In other words, this is something which is entirely one that gives rise to, uh, it arises because of individual propensities and it gives rise to necessarily an individuals being better off through such participation than otherwise. Now, therefore, you have here this, this distinction between a liberal concept which suggests that individual agents are under no coercion but participate in the process of commodity production and by extension in the processes of a capitalist economy of their own volition and are better off through such participation as contrasted with the Marxian notion of a spontaneity of capitalism in which people are coerced into playing certain roles coerce into participating otherwise they fall by the wayside and therefore you have imminent tendencies working out in real life in real history through the actions of individuals who are as it were while being nominally the dramatis personae are actually acting because in particular ways because they are coerced to do so now this contrast actually runs through the entire uh, history of economics and and, and, and of course this contrast runs through to this day and there's a very basic contrast between liberalism and, 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 and Marxism. Now this, this contrast can be stated differently that there are two notions within the liberal tradition about 
capitalism, both of which Marxism would reject because both of which go against the spontaneity of capitalism. The first notion is that capitalism in some sense is an optimal system. That, that you know, this notion later on gets enshrined in the concept of Pareto optimality, that everybody participating in the capitalist processes is ipso facto better off. Because if they are individual agents who are participating, they must be doing so because they are better off, otherwise they can just, just withdraw. So if participation is through individual volition, then people must be better off. Akhil Bilgrami has actually critiqued Locke's theory of social contract on the basis of the fact that according to Locke, the enclosure movements which Marx derided as constituting primitive accumulation of capital actually resulted in an improvement in the conditions of life of everybody, including the workers. So. That is one aspect of it. The second aspect is, of course, that the, the liberal tradition emphasizes is the malleability of capitalism. That, OK, capitalism makes everybody better off or even participation voluntarily, necessarily voluntarily in commodity production makes everybody better off. But, but even so, you can be made even better off. Or if perchance there are occasions when there is a slippage in the system, uh, like Keynes talked about, for instance, if you have mass unemployment and so on, in that case, the system is malleable enough to permit an intervention by the state to rectify these kinds of problems. Therefore, the system can be either made even better off, or if there's a slippage, that slippage can be easily rectified through the intervention of the state without any damage to the modus operandi of the system itself. The Marxist notion of the spontaneity of capitalism would reject both these, namely the so-called optimality of capitalism, that everybody is better off in some sense, as well as the fact that intervention by the state can occur without jeopardizing the modus operandi of the system itself, particularly when we are talking about interventions that go against the imminent logic of the system. Now, I say all this because I think all this has a very important bearing upon what is happening in today. They have a bearing upon the crisis which contemporary capitalism is in fact facing. Because Liberal economics would, by its very nature, see this crisis very differently compared to, for instance, the way Marxism would see this crisis. Liberal economics typically sees the crisis either as non-existent, uh, that, you know, really speaking, there is no tendency towards a crisis, maybe some minor dislocation which would be set right over time, uh, which, for instance, would be what the strict Walrasian system would argue. Leon Walras, the French economist who built this general equilibrium system, would argue that based on what is called Say's law. Alternatively, it would say that, you know, and this was Schumpeter's argument, that crisis is something which is really ultimately self-correcting. Crises are cyclical, but of course the cyclical crises happen and they would disappear over time. This third kind of, of response of liberal economics to crisis, the Keynesian response, that yes, crises may arise because of the functioning of the system, but the intervention by the state can always, rect by the bourgeois state, by the capitalist state, can always rectify. Of course, Keynes wouldn't call it a capitalist state, but the intervention by the state in a capitalist society can always rectify this kind of crisis. So the cognition of a crisis is always tempered in the liberal tradition by this. As opposed to this, I would like to argue that the Marxist position on crisis is that crises arise because of the imminent tendencies of the system, and every crisis creates it's a conjuncture in class struggle which ca can have potentially revolutionary consequences. And I want to argue that the contemporary crisis in capitalism is exactly one such. It is a crisis which of course is produced by uh, 
the process of globalization in at least two ways you can link the current crisis to the fact of globalization. The first way is that in a world in which colonial markets are no longer available, in a world in which after Keynes everybody recognizes that capitalism can get periodically into or occasionally into situations where there is overproduction. In such a world, in the absence of colonial markets, the one agency that is available for state stabilizing the economy is, of course, the state. Now, state intervention, Keynes thought, would, would in fact stabilize capitalism forever and thereby cut the ground from underneath the feet of the Marxists. On the other hand, you have always found that any state intervention which undermines the legitimacy, social legitimacy of capital including in particular of finance capital, such as state intervention in demand management is one which has always been opposed by finance capital, by capital generally, but particularly finance capital. Uh, I, 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 mentioned, I, I discussed this very briefly last time, but I'd just like to recapitulate the argument that if it is the case that state intervention is systematically required for stabilizing capitalism, then it implies that there is a flaw in the system. It implies that the spontaneous working of the system with capitalists being the ones whose kind of you know, investment and animal spirits determine its dynamics uh, cannot really do the job properly. And therefore the question arises that if you require a state in order to stabilize the system, then the flaw in the system could be overcome by the state playing a bigger and bigger role. I mean, they, they, why, why do we need the capitalists? So there's a potential threat to the social legitimacy of capital, which arises if it is conceded by the system that state intervention on a permanent basis is required for stabilizing it. Now, as a result, while state intervention per se is not one that is opposed to by the capitalists, by no means. We have seen recently in the financial crisis, uh, President Barack Obama's administration made available $13 trillion in order to stabilize the financial system of the United States. So it's not state intervention per se, but any state intervention that tends to undermine the social legitimacy of capital that is objected to by capital, and particularly finance capital, and uh, state intervention in demand management is one such. Now that being the case, finance has always been opposed to state intervention in demand management and has always insisted upon what is called sound finance, which means balancing budgets, having at the most a certain fiscal deficit, which is a proportion of GDP doesn't exceed, which as a proportion of GDP doesn't exceed a, a, a small trivial percentage, like 3% or something. Uh, this, of course, is something which was not necessarily always enforceable early in the midst of the Great Depression, for instance. But on the other hand, globalization has meant that while finance is globalized, the nation state continues, the state continues to be a nation state, and therefore the nation state must willy-nilly bow before the dictates of finance and consequently has to pursue policies of sound finance or fiscal responsibility. Therefore, what globalization has meant is that one agency which was available to capitalism in the post-war period after the colonial markets had played out their role in stabilizing the system, that agency is no longer available. There's a second phenomenon associated with globalization which gives rise to this crisis that I'm talking about and that consists in the fact that uh, now with globalization capital flows across the globe in order to locate plants in all kinds of low wage economies like China, India and so on, Indonesia, Bangladesh, whatever, in order to meet global demand. Now, this is something which had not happened before, but this is happening with the contemporary globalization. The moment this happens then, the workers, even in countries like the United States or Britain, are really competing against the low-wage workers in the third world countries who are located in the midst of massive labor reserves, uh, 
so that as long as these low wages continue, then you would have a shift of activities from the first to the third world, at least a certain range of activities. Now this therefore uh, puts a restraint on wage increases even among the first world workers. In other words, the first world workers themselves are now subject to the downward drag on wages exercised by the third world labor reserves. I'm not saying that their wages fall to the level of third world workers, but they certainly do not rise. And, and I would say that the vector of world wages is something that really remains stable because of the third world labor reserves now exercising a drag on this entire vector of world real wages. While this happens, labor productivity is going up everywhere. Because of this, what you have is within every country and taking the world as a whole, there is a rise in the share of surplus in total output. And since it is well known that per unit of income which accrues as surplus, the amount spent on consumption is lower than the same unit of income if it accrued as wages or incomes of the working people in the world, it follows that there is a tendency towards an overproduction. Now this tendency towards an overproduction can of course be camouflaged, restrained, checked through not by state intervention, because that globalization precludes, but through, for instance, the formation of asset price bubbles that might actually give rise occasionally to boosts in the level of activity, particularly in the United States, and therefore by implication on the world economy. But once these bubbles collapse, then you find once more the nature of the crisis remain, you know, gets exposed. It follows from what I'm saying that really the contemporary world is one which which is characterized by really a protracted crisis which is a product of globalization in the sense that on the one hand it has given rise to an increase in the share of surplus in output and on the other hand it has actually prevented the one agency that could have played an offsetting role from doing so and that's the nation state. And this protracted crisis is one which is going to be with us for quite some time. It may occasionally there might be recoveries, uh, for instance, through uh, the formation of new kind of bubbles in the United States or, 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 or what have you. But on the other hand, these bubbles, number one, cannot be made to order. You, you, you cannot really order a bubble. And secondly, uh, these bubbles are bound to collapse. And when they do so, then once more, the underlying protracted crisis would uh, get exposed all over again. Now, this crisis has already had a big impact in terms of a growth in resistance to globalization all over the world. I mentioned earlier that if you take the advanced capitalist countries, even before the crisis, even before the crisis, the real wages of the workers were in fact subject to the downward drag that is exercised by third world labor reserves. Incidentally, I should also add that the shift of activities from the first to the third world at the same time do not exhaust the third world labor reserves. If they did so, then the world would be a different one. They do not exhaust the third world labor reserves for at least two reasons. One is that within the third world itself, since wages are close to the subsistence level and you find that productivity increases, the shift in the activities is one which typically gives rise to an increase in productivity. There is, as I said, a shift from wages to surplus and that in turn entails a shift towards less employment intensive products, less employment intensive activities compared, for instance, to what would have happened if income distribution had not changed and consequently even though you may have high rates of growth you find that the rate of growth of employment is much less you find that the rate of growth of labor productivity is so high that the rate of growth of employment is much less a second reason why this happens is of course what we discussed last time namely 
a process of primitive accumulation of capital that is unleashed in these economies where petty producers, peasants, craftsmen, fishermen, uh, etc., are all now subject to a squeeze, both in terms of their incomes and also in terms of their access to assets. Many of them are simply ousted, like, 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 like peasants being ousted from land. Many of them are ousted or bought off at throwaway prices. And what is more, even when they are not, their incomes are squeezed, uh, which of course makes the process of simple reproduction that much more difficult, giving rise, for instance, to the spate of peasant suicides that we see in our country. So. The third world labor reserves do not get exhausted. They exert a downward drag on third world wages, but the now they also exert a downward drag on the first world wages. And this is something which gets further accentuated in a period of crisis. This happens anyway, even if there's no crisis. But of course, in a period, I mean, even if there is a bubble sustained boom, as was the case in the 90s and earlier part of the century, but this actually becomes particularly accentuated in a period of crisis, where not only do you have low wages, but additionally, you have mass unemployment. Now, this is something which you actually witness all over the world. Joseph Stiglitz, I once quoted earlier, uh, calculates that between 1968 and 2011, the real wage of an average male American worker not only did not increase, but actually marginally declined. Much the same can be said of the British workers, and therefore you find that in the advanced countries, clearly there is a, a, a resistance to globalization, which of course expresses itself in a refracted form in terms of support from, for, 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 for Donald Trump, in terms of a vote for Brexit and so on. Uh, but on the other hand, it is something which is very, very real. Now, likewise, you find in a lot of third world countries where the working people, both because of the process of primitive accumulation of capital I was talking about earlier, and of course the fact that you have growth that is associated with rates of employment increase, which are much lower than the growth of the workforce, even the natural rate of growth of the workforce, you have therefore once more a proliferation of deprivation, and that again gives rise to a kind of resistance against globalization. But what is quite remarkable is that nowhere in the world at this moment is this resistance being led by the left. And that is one of the most striking phenomena of the contemporary world. In Latin America, where you had a left revival, admittedly a revival that did not actually break with globalization so much as used the commodity boom that had occurred under globalization in order to improve the lot of the poor and the working people. The collapse of that commodity boom has actually hurt the left. And what is more, once the United States had somewhat shifted its attention from West Asia back towards its traditional concerns in Latin America, you have uh, the encouragement of coups, parliamentary coups, and all the entire list of skullduggery, which was carried out in 1970s and 80s, repeating themselves. And therefore, the left in Latin America is now indubitably in retreat. Now, of course, I, 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 I do believe that the left in Latin America would cope with this and, and, and would revive. But there is no doubt that at this moment, it is in retreat. In fact, paradoxically, the only place in the world where you can say that a resistance, if not against globalization per se, but a resistance against the refracted consequences of globalization is being led by some sort of left is actually China, where there is a remarkable revival of neo-Maoism, which is very critical of the existing Communist Party, which had in a process of export-led growth, given rise to curtailments on workers' rights in order to give rise to this export-led growth and produced in the process fairly significant inequalities. There is now a, a, a certain nostalgia for, 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 for the Maoist period and, of course, a neo-Maoist revival that's quite powerful. In Europe and in the United States, you find that the left has been reluctant to lead 
the struggle against globalization because the left's left has a very ambivalent attitude towards globalization. This ambivalence in the context of Europe is understandable in the following way. After all, if you are thinking in terms of a struggle against globalization, then the struggle must take the form of, in some sense, a revival of the state, because the state is the agency through which you can bring about an improvement in the conditions of the working people. But any such state would mean a retreat from the project of European Union, which is really a part of the globalization project, and therefore a revival of nationalism in quotes, which of course is a, 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 a dirty word as a, because of the specific European history where two world wars were fought invoking this, this concept of nationalism. So much of the European left is really extremely ambivalent to any withdrawal from the process of globalization. And what is more, that even the idea that a left-led withdrawal from the process of globalization, precisely because it's left-led, would not have the same kinds of consequences, does not cut much ice even with the left itself. So in Europe, there is this extreme ambivalence towards globalization, which is, which is, which is uh, manifest in a number of incidents. I mean, you know, for instance, you look at uh, Syriza, which was elected in order to carry out an anti-austerity program, uh, singularly, of course, failed to do so. Uh, they may have compulsions, but, but the point is that, that they failed to do so. And many European writers, including Zizek, for instance, would not see any, would not find any fault with Syriza, not because they have some notion of how Syriza should or cope with this issue, but precisely because of the fact that they themselves have no idea how to cope with this issue. You know, in, in other words, the, 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 the lack of criticism of Syriza arises not because of some kind of a theory that suggests how to cope with globalization, but it arises because there is no theory. Uh, again, in Britain, the fact that the leader of the Labour Party was opposed to Brexit while the majority of the workers were in favor of it is something which actually unders underlines the disconnect between the left positions on the one hand and of course the bulk of the working class uh, uh, movement on the, or, 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 or working class uh, inclinations on the other hand. In the United States, the fact that Bernie Sanders, who actually got a significant amount of support because of his anti-finance capital positions, had to really withdraw from the contest is, is, is once more, I mean his, his campaign faded away, is symptomatic of the ambivalence of the left in uh, disengaging from the process, I mean, towards disengaging from the process of globalization. While that much is clear as far as advanced countries are concerned, and because of that, you actually have fascist elements which are now leading working class struggles or working class, uh, uh, who, who are articulating working class desires to disengage from globalization, uh, these fascist elements in turn are not really going to do anything by way of improving the condition of the workers because the typical analysis that the fascist elements have is that the distress of the workers arises not because of the system, but because of the existence of the other. That means the Chinese worker was stealing your jobs, or the Mexican worker stealing your jobs, or the, or the immigrants, the Muslims who come and, 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 and steal your jobs that cluttered up your country, etc. So, so fundamentally, the fascist analysis of the process of globalization is one which really sees no problem with the system. And at the same time, none of the fascist elements who are currently having an upsurge, be it Donald Trump or UKIP, though of course they have been having quarrels recently, or Marine Le Pen or whatever, uh, has any strategy 
of disengaging from the hegemony of international finance capital. There is a peculiar difference here between the 1930s and now. In the 1930s, because we were not talking about international finance capital, because finance capital was, was nation-based, German finance capital or French and so on, because it was nation-based, the fascist nationalism and the agenda of finance could gel together. While today what you have is finance is international, therefore fascist nationalism cannot gel with the agenda of international finance capital. And since the fascist elements are in no position, have expressed no desire. In fact, Trump has gone out of his way saying how sympathetic he is to the movements of, of, of international finance and how one must appease them, uh, are in no way to uh, break with international finance capital and therefore the whole agenda that might, or, or initiate an alternative agenda that might improve the conditions of the workers. In countries like India or other third world countries, this desire to, I mean, this, this ambivalence towards globalization arises for a set of different reasons. Nationalism here, of course, was an inclusive nationalism of the anti-colonial struggle and is by no means a dirty word, even though some people are now trying to give it a different interpretation altogether. But nationalism in countries like ours was an inclusive anti-colonial nationalism that we inherited. But the real issue here is twofold. First is that in the process of globalization through the shift of activities, while it is true that the working people, by which I include uh, workers, peasants, petty producers, craftsmen, fishermen, and so on, have not been beneficiaries, a segment of the middle class certainly has been. As a matter of fact, you find from a recent book by Branko Milanovic that, 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 that really the beneficiaries of globalization have been everywhere the top 1% and the Chinese and Indian middle classes. Now, how long the middle classes who have been beneficiaries of globalization would continue to support it in the face of the existing crisis that is going to hit them sooner or later remains to be seen. But they do constitute a, 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 a significant force in favor of globalization. So the left ambivalence towards globalization, to my mind, has two basic roots. One, of course, is an ideology of productionism, namely capitalism becomes obsolete historically only when its capacity to develop the productive forces runs out. That therefore you see his, a, 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 a position which I argued in my first lecture was rejected by Lenin. So, so you, you, you see that there is this notion of an emphasis of on, 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 on increase in the production forces as ipso facto being a progressive thing and of course to the extent that you can have such an increase in productive forces and globalization brings about the uh, uh, high GDP growth which is the crudest manifestation of an increase in productive forces it's supposed to be a progressive phenomenon the left se segments of the left are subject to that kind of an ideological um, kind of understanding Standing. And the second, of course, is the social and political weight of the middle class, which has always been significant, now even more so, and it is one which necessarily <laughs> implies that it tends to drag the left in a direction, at least towards an ambivalence towards globalization. One advantage which you actually find in third world countries is that third world fascism is one which is not articulating any opposition to globalization we see in our own country. On the contrary, it is one that is actually uh, uh, enamored of globalization, make in India and so on, you know, invite uh, multinational and so on. Now that of course makes it historically possible for the left because the right or, or, or the fascists are not leading the anti, uh, or, or are not leading people's resistance against globalization, not even associated with it, it leaves open the possibility of the left to actually uh, once more join itself to that resistance, resist the pressures, the ideological pressures of productionism, and shake off, if you like, the social and political uh, uh, weight of the middle class in the process of doing so. This would necessarily mean, therefore, a, de uh, a certain delinking from globalization. 
Now, I, I, I consider this delinking essential because, as I said, in the European left, the thinking is that even though there is globalization today, which is dominated by finance capital, we can move from this globalization to an alternative globalization not dominated by finance capital without passing through the intermediate stage of delinking from it and reviving the nation state or reviving nation state intervention. Admittedly, not a nation state as it exists today, not a neoliberal state, but obviously a state of workers and peasants that would replace such a neoliberal state in order to make such delinking possible. Now, this is therefore something which one has to reckon with and it must be on the agenda. But of course, one has to, and such delinking would mean support and sustenance of petty production, promotion of petty production. It would mean taking over the commanding heights of the economy, particularly including natural resources. It would mean land redistribution, which is, of course, something that, as I mentioned in my first lecture, constituted the core of the Bolshevik uh, understanding, or, you know, I mean, to begin with nationalization of land, but with the revolution, land redistribution. It would mean, for instance, the defense of democratic institutions. It would mean uh, an engagement whereby the new state is now interested in providing a whole range of uh, services like education and health and so on free for the entire population. Now these are aspects of the democratic revolution through which we can actually begin our disengage, I mean, which is the other side of our disengagement from the process of globalization. But here one has to distinguish in a sense between those which are ends and those which are means. I would like to emphasize ends in the sense that you don't, I mean, you know, that, 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 that there are certain things towards which, for instance, taking over the commanding heights of the economy, instituting capital controls that prevent the hegemony of globalized finance upon state policy, all these uh, can in fact serve certain specific ends. And I have for a very long time been arguing the kind of ends that we should think of uh, should be very clear, very direct and, 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 and articulated by the left uh, unambiguously. And those, for instance, in my view, should be the institution of a whole set of economic rights which are universal, justiciable for all citizens in order to develop the notion of a citizenship in which I include the right to food, right to employment, right to um, the free, universal, quality healthcare, free universal quality education, and of course the right to old age pensions, disability benefits and so on. One can expand these rights, but I believe that a state of workers and peasants that can come in the place of a neoliberal state can disengage from globalization, but this disengagement would, would be the means to an end, the end being the instituting of a set of universal economic rights in order to establish a kind of citizenship. Now, liberalism has a very peculiar attitude to economic rights. People like Dawkins, for instance, argue that there is no point in having rights unless they can be guaranteed by the state. Now, since the state cannot guarantee these rights, there is no point having these rights. But you ask yourself the question, why can't the state guarantee these rights? If capitalism, as liberal economics argues, is a malleable system, if capitalism can be so turned and twisted and amended and, and, and altered that it can actually be compatible with full employment, which is what Keynes believed, compatible with the granting of all these rights, then what is it, what is there to prevent the institutionalizing of these rights? And this is where I, I personally believe that, that, that liberalism engages in a kind of bad faith, because you cannot on the one hand claim that capitalism is a malleable system, and on the other hand claim that these rights, which everybody would agree, should not be instituted because they are not possible under capitalism. So 
the point is that the, that liberalism therefore is completely opposed to these rights whenever i have talked about these rights i find that many uh, marxists are also opposed to it on the grounds that the, 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 these are individual rights and marxism does not believe in apotheosizing the individual to that i would just like to make three comments the first comment i would like to make is that we are talking about the agenda of the democratic revolution just as redistribution of land which is after all meant to re to, to 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 strengthen peasant agriculture does not mean living with petty proprietorship from here to eternity likewise the instituting of individual rights does not mean apotheosizing the individual from here to eternity in 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 other words this is something which is a transitional demand and in the process of the development or in the process of progress of the revolution these transitional demands can in fact give rise to other arrangements and so on and 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 consequently one has to see it only as transitional second point i'd like to make is that even the notion the dialectics of the individual and the collective has to be understood differently this dialectics according to marxism does not mean in my view the abrogation of the individual what it actually implies is that the individual finds self realization and self fulfillment in being part of the collective in other words it's not a, it's not something which actually says that the individual is either submerged by the collective or the individual is placed above the collective but in fact there is a dialectic between the individual and collective where the individuals uh, you know as i said self realization occurs through the process of being part of the collective uh, and and the third point i would like to make is that in societies like ours which have had millennia of institutionalized inequality taking horrendous forms like untouchability unseeability and so on this this this, this horror of the caste system i think the development of a notion of a universal citizenship itself represents a remarkable progressive step and i think the left must take an initiative in actually uh, enforcing that particular step and, and and in demanding that kind of a step now therefore i believe that you know if i if i look at the world today it reminds me of a film by louis bunuel the exterminating angel in which if you recollect a lot of people who had gathered for a dinner party could not leave uh, a, a room because psychologically they simply could not leave the room uh, i believe when i look at globalization today something of that kind strikes me the liberals wallow in it the left is ambivalent towards it and 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 dreams of a future better globalization but a dream that really leaves no scope for intervention in the current globalization and of course the right which pretends that it is really against globalization is not against any any any, any systemic is is not for any systemic attack on on globalization but it is really against uh, some other the others so some such so some workers muslims mexicans chinese and so on and so forth so really this arrangement of contemporary globalization is something which nobody seems to be able psychologically to move out of and i believe the left must rid itself of that psychological position and move out of this globalization by putting forward an agenda of delinking from it which would then be the beginning of a new revolutionary praxis and of course it would be something which is essentially based on the defense of the democratic rights of the people the democratic revolution which now is unthinkable without a defense of the democratic rights of the people I began in the in the very first lecture I had talked about the fact that uh, Marx in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte had actually talked in terms of a socialist revolution not being a dazzling phenomenon unlike bourgeois revolutions which really tend to dazzle I think the Bolshevik revolution had been a dazzling phenomenon because of the circumstances which in a sense perhaps uh, was a, a limitation of the revolution but I think it's very important that the that we should remember that the contemporary times are such
that not only are they propitious for a revolutionary transcendence of capitalism, not only is it the case that there is a conjuncture different from the one that Lenin was talking about, which prevails today, which is ripe for a change away from the existing global capitalist order. But what is more, this change would not necessarily be a very heroic or dazzling one and therefore is likely to be even more enduring. Thank you very much.